Welcome to SimCast, a podcast brought to you by the Society for Imaging Informatics and Medicine. Welcome to this episode of SimCast. Today we'll be talking about the administrative pathway and more specifically the path and role of the Chief Medical Informatics Officer. We'll be speaking with Dr. Julie Holberg, Dr. Nabil Safdar, Dr. Chris Roth, and Dr. Jeffrey Sunshine. Dr. Safdar is Vice Chair of Imaging Informatics at the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at Emory University School of Medicine and is also Associate Chief Medical Information Officer for Emory Healthcare. He works closely with a group of physicians, physicists, clinical informatics and researchers who are actively bringing innovative solutions to advance clinical, educational, and the research missions of Emory Healthcare. In addition, he leads a one-year imaging informatics fellowship for physicians interested in developing their interest and skills in imaging informatics. Dr. Jeffrey Sunshine has been a longtime voice in the chief medical information officer community working to promote and advance the use of technology to improve patient outcomes. At University Hospital in Cleveland, he's a primary liaison between clinical and IT staff helping to facilitate and integrate the use of their UH Care electronic medical record and many clinical applications across the system. Dr. Julie Holberg attended Baylor College in Michigan for medical school and then proceeded to Ann Arbor, Michigan for training in internal medicine at St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital. She has been a hospitalist at Emory Healthcare for 13 years and then CMIO for 10 years. Dr. Chris Roth serves as an associate professor in neuroradiology, vice chairman of health information technology and clinical informatics for Duke Radiology, and also as the director of imaging informatics strategy for Duke Health. He leads the enterprise-wide imaging informatics strategic development and governance at Duke University. We hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you for joining us. So first question, Dr. Holberg, while many radiologists, technologists, PACS administrators, et cetera, end up doing some amount of administrative work as part of their job, most don't end up on the administrative path. What pulled you onto this path? Was it by choice? Was it by circumstance? It was more by circumstance than choice. I came to Emory in 2008, and in spite of being a major academic medical center, there was a lot of the workflows were still on paper, both CPOE and documentation and the hospital. And I had trained in a place that was entirely electronic. And so at that time, I decided to offer to be a physician champion and went from being a physician champion to a medical director and then to Emory's CMIO. I think it was a case of it was tough sell to implement EHRs early on. And Emory was looking for people who were enthusiastic about implementing more technology. It's interesting because this is a way that I think lots of informaticists in the recent years have actually taken to the administrative pathway with the explosive growth of EHRs. If you look across the SIM organization, you see a number of younger, hungry leaders who understand quality improvement and just happen to be in their organization and have shown a penchant for leadership who were recruited into the electronic health records rollout or a new PACS rollout or something like that as a physician champion. And then as they grow in their responsibilities, as they realize that there are opportunities for imaging outside of their typical world in obstetrics or dermatology or cardiology or ophthalmology or the other places, all of a sudden somebody with imaging experience has value and they get pulled into additional roles and you sort of grow your administrative responsibilities over time doing that. So I think what's valuable is people wind up self-selecting in that way. They get pulled into it because of the circumstances at their hospital, but they show leadership and all of a sudden they're doing more than what their job was a few years ago. Can I just ask Chris, maybe I'll start with you. Do you have some sense of when CMI 
CTO positions even started in the first place. Like I imagine CTO positions existed some degree longer than that, but even vice chair of informatics, aren't these relatively new positions? Yeah, vice chair of informatics positions sort of started around in radiology 2010 to 2015. I was actually one of the first vice chair level in the department, which actually was a bit contentious because I was pretty young. But for the CMIOs, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know in radiology, with the growth of informatics and PACs and image management and image sharing and decision support and all the things that are specific to imaging that really took off around 2010, that's when the recognition of chairs and deans really helped grow the CMIO or the vice chair role in each department. Emory was uh, really early in 2010 when I became the second CMIO. Emory had one for six months. I would agree. I think the CMIO roles maybe started three to four years before that, but definitely was early in 2000s when the CMIO role was first coming. So if I may ask, if any of you are still part-time clinical, how much time do you spend on clinical responsibilities and how do your admin responsibilities affect your clinical time and vice versa? So I think it's absolutely essential to have clinical responsibilities. It becomes very easy to, or would be very easy to forget the daily grind and the challenges of EHRs and PACs and other systems. See, my own job is officially 10% clinical, but I practice more 20 to 25% clinical because I enjoy it. And because I think 10% for me is not enough time as a hospitalist to keep my skills up and keep myself connected to my fellow clinicians. At my institution, I'm 40% clinical, 60% admin, and it breaks down to 20% to my department, 20% to my enterprise, and 20% the department gives to everybody for teaching and research and other things that they may want to do. Now that winds up, yes, I'm 40, 60, but it sort of feels like 40, 90 because the administrative informatics responsibilities just become consuming. And it really truly is two jobs. There's been a few of us across the country who've had this conversation and it seems like the average is somewhere around 50, 50, and I'm fortunate to be 40 clinical, 60 admin. For me, it's 20% clinical, 80% non-clinical. And I use the term admin. I wouldn't say it's exclusively admin. It kind of is a mix, right, of all the other missions besides clinical work, including education, research, but also a significant amount of administrative time. And I would echo what both, I think, Dr. Roth and Dr. Holberg were saying that you have to, in some ways, become very good at figuring out when clinical time and non-clinical time can overlap. Sometimes it's okay to take a meeting during your clinical time. I'm a pediatric radiologist during my clinical time, but there are other times where it just doesn't work and you have to cancel or decline meetings. And there are times where you're addressing clinical issues during your administrative time as well. There aren't always clean demarcations between those different times And both of those tend to expand beyond their allocated percentages. For me, like Christopher, I think, you know, there's a portion of my time that is allocated to the children's hospital, a portion to the enterprise, a portion to the department, radiology. And my goal is for any one of those parties to think they have the majority of my time if I'm doing my job well. I've got a follow-up, and I'm going to throw this to Julie, because you mentioned in the chat that you hired Nabil, and it was a smart decision. Generally speaking, who is making the decision for how many FTEs to throw at the informatics problems of a department? Is it the CMIO? Is it the the department chair? Where are those decisions made for allocation of resources? So I think it depends upon the size of your system and the structure of your executive leadership team. So for example, at Emory Healthcare, we've got 11 acute care 
hospitals at over 200 clinics. And so for us, the allocation of FTEs is at the top system level executive decision making. And it is always a fight for more FTEs. There's always more demand and more work than there is resources. The other thing that I think is challenging is explaining to people what is informatics in comparison to IT or your information systems. And so that has also been something that's been really important is to help the top executive leaders understand that informatics is distinct from IT. We're great partners, but we need FTEs in addition to IS. As a CMIO, I look to build a team with complementary skill sets. And Nabil has, as an imaging informaticist, has deep skill sets in imaging informatics, but also in data analytics, which is not something that I'm as strong in. And so I think having that complementary team between different types of clinicians that have all gone into informatics can be really, you know, powerful and beneficial for the organization. So, Nabil, you touched upon having to balance your time between the enterprise, the department, and the children's hospital. So how do each of you kind of balance your time between all of these different levels of the administration? And all of you are also part of different national societies as well. So, you know, that's another poll. What resources have you been given to help you fulfill your informatics goals at your institutions? Like, are you in charge of their PACS team or other quality team, blah, 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 those kind of things? Let me start with you, Nabil. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think this question of support is a really key one. I've been fortunate that I have access to teams, resources, expertise, and support from my leadership, including Dr. Holberg and the chair of radiology, Dr. Meltzer, who in different capacities have given me access to various teams with kind of deep expertise. That may be the PACS technical team. It may be the analytics folks, which are maybe analysts, but also understand big data infrastructure and strategy. There are project managers. There are business analysts. There are EMR workflow analysts and experts as well. Because one thing that I've been fortunate to discover during my journey is that it doesn't just stop at imaging, right? Especially now, as we're getting more and more into enterprise imaging, we're talking about clinical decision support, the ordering process, image exchange, all of those naturally flow into the EMR. And increasingly, the audience for these enterprise imaging applications are not radiologists or cardiologists, but we're working more with ophthalmologists, dermatologists, pathologists, and then folks who are working in non-clinical areas who just want to make sure they have a really clean ordering process, being able to receive results in a timely manner, clinical decision support, et cetera. So I think a lot of times there are resources in a lot of enterprises where there is expertise. It's about making sure that your leadership gives you access to those resources, that you develop relationships with them, because if those resources don't have your trust and vice versa, it can be really difficult to move forward. A lot of times it requires conversations that are had offline away from the stage or the big meeting that says, hey, what's really possible? How big of a lift is this going to be? Is this feasible given the resources and the timeline that we're given? You know, there's one leader of analytics at our organization who recently retired who said, anything is possible with enough money, people, and time. And in informatics, I think in general, that tends to be true, but that's the rub. Also, there's never enough money, people, and time. So it's about competing priorities and it's about making people feel like they're heard. And I think getting access to those human resources, that expertise, and those budgets, frankly. I mean, a lot of what I've learned from Dr. Holberg and others is advocacy for your most important projects for your program. It's about asking and making the pitch compelling to leadership so that they know that they're going to get a great return on investment when they give you extra FTEs or extra budget, whether it's for PACs or whether it's for a whole new EMR. Two 
follow-up comments I would add to what Nabil had to say is that advocacy for your priorities can't start at budget time. You need to be thinking about building those relationships with the executives and the people who make budget decisions all year long so that they understand the value of your work and the important projects that you're going to be advocating for. The other thing I wanted to add is that as organizations are new in building their informatics programs, it's very common, I think, for leaders to have to lead by influence without resources. So, you know, early in my CMIO career, it was just me and it took, you know, a good three to four years before I was able to start building a program. And that has its own unique challenges as well as its advantages. So for some of the listeners out there who might be at a place with a newer informatics department, it's definitely still possible, even if you don't have resources. It just, it's really about that advocacy and the building the relationships. And I would build a branch point off of both Dr. Holberg and Dr. Safdar. I would say that if you are the person that owns the strategic vision at your organization for what you want imaging or what you believe the best practices are for imaging and how they should be deployed at your organization, if you are the person that knows all of that and can convey all of it to leadership in terms of defining priorities, in terms of defining what the resource inputs are necessary to be, Included in that, tying it to your organization's strategic plans. Your hospitals will already have strategic plans that are part of non-informatics efforts, non-imaging efforts, showing the linkages between the imaging priorities that you have and their priorities really becomes valuable. It becomes valuable to you as a leader. It does take a whole bunch of work. It takes you sticking up your hand and learning as much as you can and really putting those things on paper to be consumed by ultimately the decision makers, not the budget decision makers, as Dr. Holberg said, way before that, it's people in your own department. It's your colleague physician champions and peers in your organizations. It's staff that you work with. It's a number of different people. If you're the person that can convey that vision, it becomes really a great point for you to justify yourself as a resource to get some of that funded time. And in many cases, it takes you sticking your hand up and say, I've got some ideas here. Let's talk about it and really refining your message to make yourself that expert in your own organization. All right. Thank you all. So I'm curious, you said each one of you did say that you're still doing some amount of clinical work. So I'm actually curious about that. If you're doing less clinical work than you would have been, you know, doing hundred percent, you're doing 20 or 40% clinical work. How do you feel about staying in touch with the pain points of the members of your department and also beyond your departments, the pain points that they're feeling? So I think this is a key point that it's essential for us as physician leaders to stay connected to other members of the clinical care team. And I would say that it's very easy to not spend as much time doing that as you need to. It's easy to retreat into the land of meetings and admin work. And in addition to rounding or doing clinical work, I think it's really helpful if you proactively put time on your calendar to go out and just observe in various clinical areas or to take time to join faculty meetings and hear about people's pain points. But I think that it's something that is more challenging to do and it's easy for it to fall off your calendar. And so intentionally blocking time to do that has been one of the techniques that I've used to try to stay in touch. Now that we've had a new challenger approach, I'm gonna bring you into the full Dr. Sunshine. Can you tell us a little bit about how much clinical work you're doing? And then same question, how do you stay in touch with the pain points? Sure. I think on paper, um, something like 10% clinical. My guess is on various weeks, it takes more than that. And I believe so strongly in this that I take a full allotment of clinical call. A part of my clinical work is interventional. So part of that is to keep those skills up, but part of it is to be very active. I've been in this role for more than a decade, and I was always concerned, and I still would be, that after several years, if I wasn't active clinically, I wouldn't have the right tethers. And to the heart of this question, 
wouldn't really have a way to feel what our colleagues were doing. And the CMIO role in particular, I think, asks us to represent frontline clinicians in everything from tactics to operations and strategies. And to do that effectively, at least I feel like you have to be part of it. I'll just add briefly that I do think that there are squeaky wheels in everybody's departments, healthcare system, hospital. They're the folks who consistently will let you know, Nabil, this thing is horrible. And I've told you 70 times and you still haven't fixed it. And, you know, every time you explain to them why there are certain barriers to it, they nod their head. But then a week later, they're texting or calling again and saying the same thing. Those are not the folks that I worry about in terms of telling me what the problems are. The folks that I worry about are the ones who are silently suffering with a legitimate problem and workflow, something that's keeping them glued to their computer, to the EMR or some other application at night, what we would call pajama time. And they're not letting us know what's going on because they've got this learned helplessness. And I think those are the folks that you really need to be more purposeful about seeking their complaints out. You know, they're not naturally the squeaky wheels, but they have legitimate grievances about the systems they're using and they need to be sought out and given forum to air those grievances. All right. Thanks. I want to take it back a little bit to where we were talking about kind of getting onto the ladder of the vice chair of informatics or CMIO track. I'll start with you, Nabil, since you have another hat as a fellowship coordinator in informatics. When I was doing my fellowship, it seemed to me as a radiologist coming out of that, you had a few different choices if you actually wanted to use informatics in your career. If you were in private practice, you could potentially go the CMIO route, or you could just be the vendor liaison for your group. If you're in academics, there's a few more options, the vice chair of informatics, for example, and then entrepreneurship and other things, you know, industry type of work was the other main path I could think of. What kinds of qualifications do you think people need in order to become a vice chair of informatics? And especially, I'm interested in the person who's coming out of residency or fellowship and knows that that's the way they want to go, but they can't very well market themselves right off the bat and apply for positions at such a high level, I would think. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm not sure that there's one clear answer. First of all, I would say that the primary qualification for doing informatics work or any kind of administrative work is showing up, making yourself available to solve problems that exist for more than just you. If you have identified problems that you're experiencing yourself or that you know your colleagues are, whether they're radiologists or hospitalists or dermatologists in clinic, or for that matter, our nursing colleagues, right? If you have identified a problem that needs fixing, it's something that you realize is a situation that can't stand as is and be conducive with good patient care, then the first qualification is showing up and saying, this is a problem I'd like to help fix. Finding out if there's a committee or work group or task force that's already working on it. If not, you create it. That type of stepping up and taking ownership for a problem is challenging and rare because we are all overtaxed with our own clinical work and other competing burdens. But from that type of initiative, there are incredible opportunities to learn. And in general, by showing your value as a potential leader in informatics at that point, people recognize what you have to bring to the table and they're willing to eventually give you more and more time because the return on investment for your time far outweighs any type of compensation for clinical productivity lost. And from that basic qualification, there are all kinds of different paths. I mean, some people come to clinical informatics and imaging informatics from a strongly research path. Most of my non-clinical work before I came to Emory was actually research-oriented But then that led more and more to practical clinical informatics. And over time, I realized that that was a way that I could add value to a system. Some folks are doing a lot of education, but I think, you know, look, this is still an early field. It's not critical, 
although it may be desirable to have board certification in clinical informatics or a certification or being a certified imaging informatics professional. Those things are valuable and desirable, but not absolutely critical. I think the most important, I'm just going to sound cliche, but the most important qualification is that you show up, you're willing to spend the time, and you develop leadership skills that have to do with listening, networking, being able to make a presentation. A lot of these are not things that were taught in medical school or even necessarily in an informatics fellowship. I would echo what Nabil said and add that I think leadership and grit are essential. It is challenging to solve problems with EHRs and imaging informatics systems and all of the various technology platforms that we have. And I think In my job, having this really strong communication skills, leadership skills, and a willingness to roll up your sleeves and keep fighting to make things better is what makes CMIO or a a vice chair of imaging informatics successful. Many of us started in our positions over 10 years ago. Informatics fellowships weren't as prevalent as they are now. And I think in the last 10 years, there's been a great growth of informatics fellowships, as well as opportunities to get master's in informatics, particularly there's MPHs with a focus in informatics. And I think in the future, there probably will have those requirements either for formal training in informatics or a master's degree. But early on, when those programs didn't exist, many of us just learned on the job and did leadership training and other informatics training after. Julia, I'd echo that. I think there's a myriad paths in formal education ultimately may become preferred, but at least today, it's not yet absolute. And I would say any formal education is terrific for the body of knowledge and some of the skills it can bring you. But this is fundamentally a leadership position that's technology enhancing in both directions. The technology enhances us, and we're here to enhance that. And the comments that have been made that starting with L Project or getting involved with uninitiative is the best way to get started. And taking ownership and feeling what that's like are important initial steps. And I think I would add that it's often about one's ability to grow constituencies, to be able to talk to different people in different domains and to help shuttle across those perspectives to common ground towards goals. And those are very easy to say and difficult to execute. And like everything we do, come better with practice. So I wouldn't be surprised to learn that many of us did some smaller things along the way. I can certainly share that in my case, there was a technology shift going on. I'm old enough that it was film to packs, and they needed somebody to sort of represent the radiologist in that discussion. And that became not representation, but leadership. And when that was successful, that helped me have a flavor of what's happening and also the institution and the department to notice whatever skills I may have had inherent that could be further developed. I certainly was not a CMIO at that time. The term didn't even exist. So to answer where to start, I would encourage formal education, but that is not in and of itself, I think going to get you where you want to go, having some experience in your institution or department where you've gradually moved into a leadership role, even if it's a smaller domain, are the places to start. I'm totally with everybody on this one. You know, just like an MD doesn't make you a clinical doctor, getting an informatics degree or a certification does not make you an informaticist. I was fortunate to do a master's in informatics through the Duke Business School, half healthcare informatics and half actually year one business school. To Nabil's point, you did learn a lot of things that medical school doesn't teach you about how to work with teams and how to give you a system-wide perspective and understanding. It also did some things like putting me in contact with leadership that I never would have had an opportunity to interact with. You know, any additional degree does show that you're serious about that path of work, right? You can do research as an MD, but if you're an MD, PhD, it's just a little extra feather in your cap. 
there are lots of formal opportunities out there. There's the imaging informatics professional degree through SIM. There's a CP HIMS or a CA HIMS that the HIMS organization puts out that's terrific for imagers because it provides perspective on the pain points that non-imagers face every single day. It helps you learn what really is happening outside of the literal and figurative black box that imagers live in. Literal meaning it's a dark room, figurative meaning it's a very ill understood room or area of those hospitals. So I think formal education is great, but it, you certainly can't stop there. You actually have to get yourself in the weeds, get in, get dirty and start doing some work to really move up your organization. And I'd add to Chris's point that there's also certifications you can get in leadership training. And I would encourage physicians to consider that regardless of whether they've gotten a informatics certification or not. Looking at some of the different physician executive organizations really helps to complement the skill set you need in all of these roles that we don't cover in medical school. Chris, you've talked about going back and getting more formal education, but at that point, you were probably already on a bit of a leadership track. Did you find that getting your master's in informatics helped change your trajectory for your career path? And more broadly to the other guests, do any of the rest of you have either MBA, MHA, clinical informatics boards, or other leadership type degree or certification? I think it may have changed my trajectory some. I'm not sure if it's worth you know, getting the initials if you're already on that pathway. I also am American Board of Preventative Medicine certified for informatics. So I think in the role of leadership, to Dr. Sunshine's point, you have to be able to speak the language that everybody else is speaking. You have to understand what their pain points are. Getting yourself some general informatics education, if you will, is certainly helpful. Being part of project teams across your practice or your enterprise is valuable, and I would submit more valuable than the degree itself. The degree can certainly, if you have the opportunity to do it, benefit you. But I think there are probably other more beneficial ways to pursue that interest. And I'll add to that a little bit. I agree 100% with what Dr. Roth just said. I mean, the credentials, the training programs at the end of the day are important and nice to have, and they bring value, but it is stuff that can be learned along the path as well. I mean, for myself, I did an imaging informatics fellowship. I did do an MPH after I was already a radiologist, which did help with my statistical and analytical orientation, also kind of basic research methodology. And then eventually did the ABPM clinical informatics boards. And all of these help provide a vocabulary and orientation frameworks and knowledge, which if you're using them wisely, will influence how you do your work. If you're not thinking deeply about these lessons along the way, then they just become another line on your CV and probably not a good use of time, to be honest. Thank you all. So I've got a question I'd like to have each one of you give your take on. What things do you wish you knew before you started on this path of mixing clinical and administrative work? So maybe we can start with you, Dr. Sunshine, and then we'll go around. Great. I've been giving that some thought for a few minutes. You know, I don't think I appreciated just how broad a reach being a system administrator requires. It's not less work than being a clinician. It's more work. And I think sometimes there's an allure to this that seems like, oh, you know, they don't have to, if you're a radiology, crank through the image sets that the frontline radiologist does. They're just in a room, much the way it sometimes can seem to people from the outside that researchers aren't stressed because they're writing a grant. That doesn't look too bad until you try to do one. So to me, the breadth of the impact on me as a person to be good in a system leadership role, how encompassing that is from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed and across your weekends. These are real all-encompassing positions. And to the comment made earlier, it's about showing up. It's also about raising your hand and really wanting to be the person who has those kinds of responsibilities. It isn't for everyone. 
I think it's been incredibly rewarding, but I'm not sure I fully understood the breadth and depth that it would require. Dr. Holborg, would you like to go next? Sure. I would say I had no idea how thick a skin you need to be in administration. It is one of the most rewarding jobs because my general philosophy in life is as you face problems, you can either choose to be part of the solution or you can be someone that just sits around and whines about it. And I've always wanted to be someone like Dr. Sunshine said, who raises her hand and says, hey, I want to help be part of the solution. But in leading that, those problem-solving efforts, you face a lot of folks who are doing their best but are just disgruntled and frustrated, and you need to have thick skin. And the second thing I knew a little bit but I've really come to value is developing a network of other leaders and people who are in informatics so that when things are tough, you have colleagues that you can reach out to to get a fellow idea about how to solve a problem or you can get some sympathy and support. And I found with Sim as well as with Amia that and other organizations, you can connect with your fellow physician leaders, which is really important. Lastly, I didn't necessarily realize that silence is sometimes as good as it gets, meaning people don't necessarily compliment you when things are working as they're supposed to. So the lack of complaints is a good day. Dr. Stoffdale, you want to go next? Yeah, Mohanan, I had no idea how much email one person could get in a given day. You know, I wish I knew how to, at that point, better, again, we've commented on this before, these are things that you're not taught in medical school or training, or even during these formal training programs that we may undergo for informatics, managing your time, managing projects, and to what Dr. Sunshine said earlier, it's not easier than clinical work. It is a different type of work. There are different types of flexibility in your schedule. It's just a very different type of work with high stakes. Your failure on a certain project or with a certain deadline could have a big impact, not just on you or one individual patient, but a whole enterprise involving many patients and many providers. So there's different types of pressure But really what I'm incredibly surprised by, and I would love to learn from you all individually how you handle this, is like the sheer volume of messages and email. I am still trying to figure out how to handle that. So advice is welcome. Jamil, I was going to say Thomas Lothelm, who's a radiologist out at Davis doing good informatics work, had a tweet a couple days ago about how he's got an average of 80 emails every day. And I reply, you have to simplify your life, man. (laughs) I think the one exception to that I would make is for people like you guys, who that is the job is every email is a task and you have to handle 80 of those tasks a day. Chris, do you want to give your answer? Yeah, I've actually got two and one extends off of Jeff Sunshine's a second ago. You've really got to love the grind of how expansive informatics is. I'm a neuroradiologist by day, but I'm on vacation actually today. And I was comparing on a board review for the ADPM, the hierarchical natures of SNOMED against ICD-10, which just isn't something you do in imaging, really. But that was the question that the ADPM put in front of us. Earlier this week and last week, I gave lectures to our radiology residents, fellows, and faculty about phishing and cybersecurity because of some events at my hospital. It is pretty broad. The second thing I would say is how rewarding the job is to see a big thing happen that you took part in, whether it's an EHR deployment or it's an archive or a viewer change or you know something big that you're doing and recognizing the number of patients that touches, the number of your colleagues that that touches. That's why I do it is because you can really be a part of some big important things and really feel like all the work that you're putting in is worth something. All right, perfect. Thank you guys so much. We're coming up on the hour. So I'm just going to close that out with one last kind of related question. And the question is, why, when we were putting together this episode, did we have such a difficult time finding CMIO radiologists? There's a bunch of, in SIM and in the SIM community, there's a bunch of vice chairs of informatics, but it was much harder to find. And I realize you're all very busy and that's part of the answer. 
you suggested you might have a bit of an answer to this. So I'll start with you. I would love to hear also what Dr. Holbrook has to say since she is internal medicine hospitalist. I would say that from my experience, you know, so I'm an associate CMIO at Emory. I think that evolved very naturally based on what I could add in terms of value from an imaging informatics perspective at the enterprise. And then that grew to what I could add in terms of value for analytics, which many of us are familiar with. And then um, slowly other things, as I worked more and more with the CMIO, Dr. Holberg, there was a exposure to more and more non-imaging areas. So I think first part of it is, you know, as a radiologist, what was the last time most radiologists, unless they're interventionalists, perhaps thought about med rec or thought about how transport and bedding is done in the hospital, about ADT and transfers from the ER up to the floors. I mean, that's just not a part of the workflow for most radiologists, but for a system CMIO, that is common and requisite knowledge. So I think, you know, the background, the knowledge, the exposure is part of the issue. There has been some commentary in the past that it could have to do with, you know, radiologist compensations. And when there are new CMIO positions being advertised, oftentimes the C-suite has in mind compensating that CMIO at a level that's not commensurate with typical radiologist salary. I don't know that that's necessarily true. There may be some truth to it in smaller systems, but from what I've seen in larger systems, if a qualified person is applying and if they have a clinical appointment whether it's in internal medicine, radiology, or something else, if they are comfortable with their clinical, non-clinical mix, and they bring the right qualifications, I think larger systems and medium-sized systems are really comfortable with whatever the clinical background is. But if it's a radiologist, that radiologist must be comfortable with the entire suite of applications, workflows for physicians. You can't expect to be a CMIO and say, well, you know, what is e billing again? You know, it just doesn't work. And I'll just jump in. There was a time when I think there was only one or two CMIOs from radiology, and I was one of them. You may have the perspective. It was hard to find. I'm pleasantly surprised there are this many on the call. So it's a matter of perspective. But I would say fundamentally to me, much of what CMIOs do centers around medical records writ large. And the first thought process doesn't jump to a radiologist in that role. It's only when the broader thought swings to its managing technology in clinical space that the aha moments come. So I think it just may be the root of where it comes from. I think we're all existing examples of how it can be done well with a radiologist background, even if that isn't the obvious first place to go look. Julie, I'll give you the final word if you have anything to add on this one. Sure. I think in terms of the payment, it depends upon the structure of the salary. So you're absolutely right. You know, as a hospitalist moving into administrative work, I got a bump. Nabil, as a radiologist, I'm pretty sure makes more money than I do, even though your report's into me because we buy out his time. It's not that he got plugged into a CMIO role. So I would just say for everyone out there who's thinking about pursuing a career as a CMIO, don't let the salary negotiation stop you because I think many organizations will look to be equal to what you would make clinically, particularly if you still maintain some of your clinical time, which we've all talked about is so important. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. This has been very informative and interesting to hear some of the things that you guys have to go through. SimCast has been brought to you by the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine. Please visit our website at siim.org for more information and educational content, including webinars and an archive of prior episodes. Please follow us on Twitter at sim underscore tweets. Thank you to our listeners for your continued support.